Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Kat. And in a moment, I'm going to take you to meet a very special guest. We are joined for today's video by Torin Westcott. He runs the Instagram page Hunter of History, and I'm going to show you some examples of his work now. I think you can probably tell why we are talking to him today. I love discussing with people how they engage with history and present it. And so I am so excited that Torin has agreed to come and speak to us today. And I hope you will enjoy hearing what he's got to say as well. So let's chat to him. Hello, Torin, and thank you so much for agreeing to sit down with me remotely and have a discussion about history and also your way into history. I'm super fascinated by the way people engage with and also present history to an audience. Um, and by trade, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you are a filmmaker. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm a filmmaker and I work in TV and across digital branded stuff and do all sorts really. So yeah, in, in, in the creative business. A visual history is what we're here to talk about. Because I'll be honest, I haven't seen anybody doing what you're doing. So I'm not really sure how I describe what you do. So how would you describe what you're doing with Hunter of History? And that is what we're here to talk about, by the way. And I'll be leaving it linked in the description box as well. As if I were explaining it to someone who's not seen it before. Yes. So I... I uh, find old photographs and then have to work out where they were taken uh, to as close a possible, uh, you know, I, I, the spot where the picture was taken and you have to be pretty precise. And then I take the same photo as close as I can and then I merge the two together. And then that presents some sort of a blend, I call it. There's not really a word for it, but a blend seems to be the best one of the two images, thus creating sort of, it's like a bit of a bridge between, between the two times. A bit of a juxtaposition, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and you've created some incredibly evocative mashups, and I will be showing some of them on screen. But what sparked this project for you? How did you come up with the idea to do this? I had a book. It was Smiley's People by John Le Carre, and the edition I had had a picture on the front, and it was, it was one of those novels where the, the picture on the front has nothing to do with the story whatever. But I worked out that it was taken around Westminster Abbey and I went to find the tree that happened to be in the picture and I held the book up and I took, I took sort of a matching shot. I think I put it on Facebook and people seemed to like that. That was quite cool. And I thought, ooh, interesting, people like that, that's fun. And it, it was fun doing it, right? Um, and then I think from the anniversary of D-Day in 2014, uh, so that's, what's that, the 60th anniversary? No, 70th anniversary. The Daily, the Daily Mail Online did uh, uh, this online thing where you could, they had pictures of famous D-Day pictures from the beaches and you could slide the page across to reveal this, the exact same photo in the modern day. And I was on it for about a day. I was just fascinated. I loved it. And then I think I just, it was quite an organic, slow evolution of then just going out and pretty, lots of people have been doing it. You take a picture, you, you hold it up in your frame and you take a picture of that so that the old photograph is actually in the frame. Mm. People, you know, I've seen people do that and I thought I'd have a go at that. And then I kind of just, for me, that felt like an obstacle. I, I enjoyed having the old photograph in vision, but somehow I wanted to see behind it or see through it. And having the old photograph in the frame was a bit of a block. It was a bit of an obstacle. So I think coincidentally at that time, I'd just learned, learned, learned a few things on, on Photoshop and discovered masking and, and this blending technique, and then it sort of just went together, I think, and then it it went from there. That's yeah, that's so cool. And I was, I mean, I was going to ask you which came first, the retro photo or the modern photo. And you have said that you start with the old photo. Have you ever tried to? Have you ever found a location that you're like, oh, I love this place, or it's meaningful to me, or somebody? Let me try and find a historic photograph that connects to it. Uh, oh, I tell you what. Every time I go somewhere new, it's now just something that I try and do habitually. Like if I'm going for work to a new town or a country, I'll think mm, I should maybe do some research, prepare a few images that I can maybe go out and find because it makes the trip more fun in itself. Knowing that you know there's there's some historical thing to go and chase, 
and find the location. Because I don't know about you, but if I go to a, I went to Florence four years ago and I was stood in, in the square outside the, the, Palazzo, the Palazzo Vecchio, right? Next to the Uffizi. And that was great. And, you know, had a really wonderful time. It's obviously it's bursting with culture. But then I came away and researched all the things that had happened in that square over the years. And it, it blew my mind. And I was sort of, uh, uh, I regretted not having known it when I was there because it mm. would have made it all the more special being stood there, you know, experiencing it. So then I kind of resolved now to try and learn about the places that I go before I go so that I can do that and find images. And yeah, I think it to, uh, to, to mess up your edit, just to go slightly <laughs> backwards. Uh, um, I knew that I was going to a beach with my dad in 2015. Uh, he lives, he came from Devon. We now live in London and we were going back there for our annual trip. And I'd, I'd seen this picture of him with his dad when he was about 18 on a rock on a beach in a place called Trebaric Strand. And I thought it would be great if I could find that rock and take a picture. And I think actually that was maybe one of the first proper like Hunter of History pictures I did. And we managed to find it. And I put him back in the picture and, you know, oh my God, like it was so evocative just because I knew that that's where my granddad had stood. I never met him dead long before I was alive. And I, I think when you do something like that, when I, in my case, I did that and it really it just kind of like, it grabbed me and it was really rewarding. And I thought, this is so fun. It's really cool. Mm. Not, only it, not only is it interesting, but it's like really, it's arresting and evocative and it captures you emotionally. And that's why I kept doing it. Yeah. I think there's that, there's that thing you, when you were talking about being in a place and knowing its history, mm. um, I've seen that you've got some pictures of Hampton Court Palace. And of mm. course that is, it's a modern tourist site. But on top of that, it's got within itself a kind of concertina of history. Yeah. That there's stuff on the site that is is pre-Norman all the way up, and and there's building works going on there right through into the Georgians. Right. And and having that that knowledge and walking in the footsteps of these people, so you you know you're walking through a great hall where Henry VIII walked, where where Anne Boleyn walked. All of that is is really powerful, I think, and and I and I can see that when someone looks at your image. For me, when I look at it, it's it's that kind of the it's that bleed of of modern and historic, and and you're having some great responses. Like it's it's the it's a popular Instagram account. What do you think people get out of it? Are they all history buffs, or do you think there's other stuff that people are getting out of it? No, I think it it just happens to speak really easily to everyone because I mean Instagram's perfect for it because it's a visual medium and everyone's on there to look at photos so if you see anything slightly interesting I think it'll, it'll it captures a bit of attention uh, and I think it doesn't matter who you are I think if you see something like that so that presents new information to you in a way that you've not seen it before or uh, allows you to think about history in a way that you've never thought about it before it's gonna it's gonna snare your your attention I think that's just one of the it's one of the upsides of doing it I think I mean I I have I think a favourite image of yours, uh, and that's the Emmeline Pankhurst. But I think that's, that speaks to me personally because of my connection to history and women's history and, and wanting to see those sorts of things enacted. Do you have a favourite image of oh, yours? Great question. Oh, man, you've put me on the spot here. Uh, yes, actually, one of the ones that I really like um, is the the Charing Cross Soho gangster dude having his shoes shined? I remember like I'd, I'd been out doing three pictures that day, and I, that was the last spot that I did. And the sun was right in front of me, so it was going to be backlit. And I thought for some reason this isn't going to work at all. It's going to be really awful. And I'll have to come back, but I'll do a shot anyway. And it just turned out that it was actually really. It, it just worked out really well, and everything about it was <clears throat> was was sort of suited it like. A certain criteria you, I think you need to have for the picture to be uh, impactful and those are things like foreground space or the number of people in the shot the amount of space behind them the photograph's got to be a certain distance away from the characters that you're shooting and all those things just se seem to work out and is I find it quite I got, find it quite compelling yeah they just feel like they feel like they're there and that's what's so great about it they feel mm. like you walk past them like, yeah that 
you saying that reminded me of that other image you've got where it's by the Thames. I want to say it's near to the House of Parliament because all I all I can think of is there's a couple stood on a bridge and there's two women from the present day almost on the other corner and it looks like they could have a conversation with each other. Yeah. And there's something there's something because I think we're we're so keen to grip the past in whatever way we can. And photography is a amazing tool for that. And before photography, we don't really have the option. Have you ever thought about trying it with a uh, hyper real painting, or would that just would that not have the same effect for you? I have. There have been certain portraits, right, where you see, um, for example, like you could see, um, um, Turner painted the Thames, or th- there are so many instances where you see you, you you clearly know that the painter was at a specific place paint, painting a vista, or a, and I've been tempted. It's like hmm, maybe I should go back and I should go and try and find find that spot. I don't think it would work quite as well. If anything, it just makes me sort of lament the fact that photography wasn't around in the Tudor period because, oh my God, can you imagine? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have a, I have a, my, my argument as to, and we and I'm going to ask you in a second what your favourite period of history is, but obviously the Tudors makes bank. Like, it's it's big business, the Tudors. And I think a massive reason for that is because we have artists like Holbein. And while it's not a photograph, it's very different to what has been, for the most part, the paintings of before. These look like individual people who are different from each other and distinct from each other. Henry VIII doesn't look like Henry VII or mm. Thomas Cromwell. They're, they're facially recognisable. And, and I do think that that's one of the reasons why we find them so compelling. Um, and before I ask you about your favourite period of history, I do want to know, is there a dream photograph or location that you haven't photographed yet, or an, an event maybe, that you've got an old photograph of that you want to do a project with? I have a list. I mean, I have a folder full of images that I've yet to get around to. Um, I, I, I'm constrained to London, really, and this, you know, the sort of south, south of England. That's where I spend most of my time. Um, so I'd, I'd say that anywhere else in the world. I mean, imagine, imagine how much you could get done in France, Normandy alone, and then Berlin. For the for Second World War photography, or my goodness, like the Spanish Civil War, Madrid. I follow a few accounts actually on Insta of Spanish people that do this exact thing, and their material. They've got so much to work with. It's, it's, it seemed like the cameras were ubiquitous in the Spanish Civil War. Everyone was snapping away. Mm. And maybe it's because the culture is different from ours. It's slightly more romantic to us because we're not English. Uh, sorry, we're not Spanish. So mm-hmm. serving a different culture is is more kind of. Uh, it's more evocative to us. It snares our attention more. Anyway, um, I'd just like to get everywhere. I'd like to do so much. Um, I think every time you discover a new photo, it's a new opportunity to do something interesting and learn about the thing that you're about to I don't always know what I'm about to talk about on, you know, when I do a story or whatever. Mm. So it's as much a learning process for me as it is anyone who's sort of paying attention on Insta, which is great. Are there any things that you wouldn't work with? I'm thinking of, of for example images after the blitz is there stuff that you just think do you know what that's not funny that you asked that i haven't personally thought that i'd I'd be quite until i discover what that thing might be it's not occurred to me yet i've not found anything that's horrified me or i mean i don't know it's a good question actually because i suppose if you came across something like for example i probably wouldn't i'd have to be very careful but i wouldn't be tempted to go to somewhere like auschwitz with a photograph because there is a fine line between what's like decent uh, you know slash interesting and what's self-serving so i would feel slightly hesitant about treading on really sensitive ground just for the sake of my instagram page uh, you know it feels self-indulgent it feels like someone more important than me should should be doing that sort of stuff and they do i don't know does that answer your question do you know yeah what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely see, I definitely see where you're coming from about, you know, going to Auschwitz, um, and I, I also understand why uh, avoid the avoidance of the political, because of, of course there are there are mashup of photographs that that one could do yeah. that would make political statements about the world we live in now and the stuff that's happening. Absolutely. But I also understand why that's not a particularly comfortable place to occupy and it, it's it, with a photograph as opposed to with 
you know, a text or the spoken word, it's so open to interpretation that that you can never control reception. And that's always something that I would I can understand completely why you're like, do you know what? <laughs> I don't know how this is going to be received. And and that can that can be concerning. It's uh, I guess on one hand, it's a little bit cowardly of me never to try and get to sort of take too firm a stance on something. I mean, I, there, are, there are photos I've got lined up where I will be taking a kind of a stance. Or it's, it's not so much that I'm taking a stance that I'm asking a question. And, and like already this makes me sound like I'm really asking, asking the questions, getting people to think, whereas really I'm just interested in history and just love the ethereal sort of mysticism of it. But I think there are some pictures where it's going to be unavoidable. For example, there's one coming up of a statue. And statues, you know, including in recent times statues have been provocative subjects with vastly different opinions uh it's a very touchy subject but it's fascinating and it's i think it's great to talk about it and you know yeah. some of these photos get a bit of a conversation going i'd like to think that there'd be an opportunity with these photos to sort of do something worthwhile make make the most use out of them get people thinking about certain issues i guess yeah Definitely. And I mean, I think, the thing, I think the thing that we as people who engage with and create media around history, we're very aware that however we engage with it, it's political mm. because we as individuals have our own politics through which we view our lived experience and the experience of the past. And that's always, however much you try to control and police yourself, your politics are always going to come out in the interpretation of history that you give. And it would be disingenuous to claim that anything else is happening. But of course, everything is highly politicized at the moment, particularly this notion of culture wars. It's, an odd position to be in because I I think much like you that what I want to do is ask the question like I might have my own opinions about things but what I'm most interested in is is the question and the discussion but sometimes it seems that people think you are asking a question with a with a foregone answer and that's the answer they have in their head not not the one that you you're putting forward so that mm. it's very interesting and, and sometimes frustrating but I think we have to keep asking the question because if we stop asking, then that reductive approach just wins, doesn't it? Yeah. And I, I definitely think that in the position that I'm in, I get, I'm, I'm in the lucky position where I get to take a photograph and put it out and ask the question and then kind of step back uh, and let the community talk about it or, you know, or comment on it or tell me what they think about it. Um, it's not, I don't feel compelled to get involved. I've asked the question. So uh, I don't, it's not interesting if you're reading, 100 comments from people just expressing an opinion either way if there's no dialogue there's no exchange of ideas then what's the point yeah uh, yeah absolutely that i don't want to just hear yes or no i want to be like but why do you think that yeah back it up tell tell teach me educate me like let's all learn together um and and that i think is what's the beauty in many ways of engaging with people on social media platforms about history and yeah providing educational content providing conversation pieces because talking about politics it, it democratizes it mm. and and in our in our country when the cost of getting a higher education is screaming through the roof um it becomes ever more important that that knowledge doesn't just live in that ivory tower and that those questions don't just get to be asked to and answered by the people in those ivory towers. Yeah, absolutely. I like the word, the, the word democratising is it's perfect because the democratisation of it lies in the fact that, you know, if I think if somebody what, sees one of these photos and just realises that, oh, that's that's the place that I walk past every day and I've never thought about it in this way, but that's something that happened right there. Just, just that sort of inkling of consideration about that place is, you know, is a step on the way towards thinking about politics and history. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like, it's like just being a bit more aware of what's been going on around you and of, of your environment and your space that you inhabit. You know, there's a lot more to every street corner than we could possibly imagine. And it's just interesting being a bit, you know, not woke, but awakened to... <laughs> to the things that have happened before and it just it promotes a bit of reflection i think and that's what's really grabbing about it it's what i enjoy about doing it 
I think also not just awareness, but I would say empathy. Yeah. When we when we can see our ancestors, somebody who is people who are so distant from us, like you know, some of these photographs we're we're going to be getting to over a century in some cases, aren't we? Yeah. And these people who are long dead but we can stand where they stood or sit where they sit. And, and there's, there's a capacity to empathize there that I think is a very useful tool that everybody currently should do their very best to develop mm. because it, it, the world can be, a, and your experience of the world can be a much happier one. I think if you, if you choose empathy first, um, it, it makes things less tense if you attempt to empathize with others. Um, and speaking of empathy and feeling, what period of history do you feel most drawn to? Man, you know what? It's like saying, it's like saying, what's your favorite flavor or something? It's too hard. <laughs> oh, it's too hard. I like to dip. I like to dip in, in and out of various ones because I, okay, so. I love Tudors, obviously. I love I love the Regency. I love medieval Europe. Um, colonial America is fascinating. The American Civil War is fascinating. Gosh, French Revolution. It's endless. Like you could talk about history all day long. I'd like to start learning a bit more about South American and African history because it's shamefully it's something I know very little about, and obviously it's vast. Um. And equally mysterious to me is, is the history of, of countries like China, who were up to stuff whilst we were over here in, in Europe squabbling, squabbling about territories. They were over there very much living in a cultivated, advanced civilization, you know. Um, oh, history is just fascinating. And it's, there's, there's so many pockets of interest, I think. Um, and what you were just saying just now about people becoming a bit more aware and empathetic it's like it's like it's the best way to champion history and to make it interesting and accessible to people because history you know no matter how interested you are as a consumer of history it is beneficial to know about and it is useful to study there's no two ways about it and that's from the minutiae to you know the the, the large scale history teaches us so much and is rewarding on so many different levels I think more people need to be encouraged to sort of leap in and, you know, get stuck in and have a wonder. What's your favourite period? Oh, see, now that's not fair. Don't turn around on me. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a Shakespeare scholar by trade, ah. but um, I have recently developed a deep interest in Georgian bare knuckle boxers and that kind of world of, wow. of of the and I and I need to know more because I want to know what it's like to walk through those streets to move around the rookeries because I spent so long in Tudor England I can f almost imagine what it's like underfoot uh -huh. and that's how I connect with history I connect with it very I want to have a kind of visceral sense of what the world is um, and I don't have that for the Georgian period so I I really want to understand that in the same way as I understand the Tudors is but, that what doing now you're building a sensory version of the world to understand it is that what you're up to that yeah that's that's kind of how how I engage with it and, and I think that that's probably and I have made a video on this already the fact that I'm dyslexic um, and I was very I was diagnosed very very late uh, as a dyslexic in fact I was diagnosed when I'd already started my doctoral studies and wow. it made a lot of sense but it also it then kind of told me how I should work that when I was writing my thesis, I had to imagine that I was writing a museum. So each chapter was was a was an exhibition in a museum that I was moving from piece to piece and explaining it. Um, and and that's how I engage with and understand the worlds of history is that I have to almost develop a floor plan in my head of where stuff is because otherwise I just I lose. I lose track of dates. I'm very bad with numbers. I always invert them. Um, mm. So, so those kinds of visual. What, what's it feel like? What's it taste like? What's it smell like? What's it like underfoot? Mm. Um, is incredibly powerful for me. Um, and you, you were talking about, I suppose, promoting history. And I, I do ask this to everybody that I interview. Why do you think history matters? 
because I think we, we're living in a world where the humanities, the value is being constantly questioned. You know, why should we tell people to study this at, at higher education? Why does it matter? And we've talked a bit about empathy and those sorts of uh, valuable things. But but if you were say if you were selling history, why does it matter? Well, I think the enthusiasm for it as as a you know as a hobby or an interest aside, history is our biggest compass as to where we need to be headed next. You know, in, in all senses, it's a uh, it it informs you about where what how things have been done before, what works and what didn't. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's and I think as you've said you've said already today, it's life is very politically charged, especially with. Well, no, not especially with. I was going to say especially with the younger younger members of society, but it's not true. It's it's been ignited across all generations of late. I think there's been so many things going on. Uh, I think it's valuable for everyone to be able to study what came before and to understand con- contextually where where they come from. And I feel I feel that history is just a giant sort of puzzle. It's a blank canvas that you're kind of painting in by numbers. The more you learn, the more the, the more clear and less obscure that picture becomes, and you're more informed about life. I, th- I just think it makes for better debate, better, just better living. You know, that's what I think. Mm, I like that. It makes for, it makes for better living, because that's that's the thing is that through our the tapestry and embroidery and I don't know mess of wool that needs to be untangled of all of our histories globally we all intersect Mm. we all we all meet up um and although we may not know each other's histories they have impacted ours and we have we have certainly impacted theirs and who we are and whoever who who our next door neighbor is and who um people across the oceans are we if we don't understand our history, then we ignore the fact that we are we are one species, and there is so much more than that connects us than divides us, and that that shouldn't ever be something that we try to shy away from. It should be something that we confront, and where necessary as well, we celebrate. I wholeheartedly support the institutions that are telling the full story of all of their pieces, because let's call it by its real name. Let's say how it got here. Provenance isn't a dirty word because knowing how something ends up in that palatial house in in Suffolk is as important as looking at it. Uh, why why wouldn't you want to know? I, I personally can't understand why somebody wouldn't want to know. Absolutely. I think you just hit upon that last part. I, like, I, I think curiosity is uh, a very important thing. And... And actually, that ties very neatly back into uh, into the, like the very best thing about why I love Hunter of History, or doing it rather, is that it it makes me curious, and I hope that people looking at it feel curious. Mm. It's simple as that, and and that is the most important thing about history. I think you've got to be, uh, you know, uh, keen to discover something new, or or learn a bit more, or understand. You're understanding yourself and your community and everything. It just fills in the blanks and. Uh, I love it when when you find out something new or discover a new pocket of information that links two seismic events. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And next, you, you understand suddenly, contextually, why, oh, oh, that was a big deal to these groups of people because that happened. And look what it did over here. And then that promoted this. And here we are. Oh, and here's maybe how we can rectify it by not doing that again. I mean, yeah. I've very broad strokes, but that's I feel that's how it works. I mean, it's evident that you have a, a deep and abiding interest and love of history that I'm assuming predates Hunter. Hunter of History is the expression of that oh, love. Yeah. Um, when when did your history geekdom first kick in? What was the thing? Oh, gosh. Not, I think, like, early 20s, I think. I had a really good teacher at school, Mr Ewins. Loved him. He was great. But it was all Gladstone and Disraeli, and at the time, just, just didn't care. It wasn't interested. Uh, we did, you know, Second World War was on the syllabus. All that stuff, very important to know about, and that's sort of in- interesting. But I think it was after school, and it was the British monarchs that started getting me interested. Like suddenly, Westminster Abbey was the place I wanted to hang out and like learn about, you know, the kings. And then I and then I read a book about the all the kings from William the Conqueror through to Elizabeth II, and was just engrossed by it. And then it's it's literally when the, the blanks start getting filled, 
and you, you have a chronological timeline of, of things happening that it just became so engaging. And then I was just discovering new, new ways to love history and just find it interesting. The, like the shame about history is that the stereotype of it is the stereotypical attitude towards history is, oh, it's stuffy and it's boring and it's for old guys in, in dusty suits. You know, but oh, it's such a shame because like history is exciting, man. And it's like the drama that people love about Game of Thrones is the drama that's occurred, you know, uh, several times over, like the Wars of the Roses or, you know, gosh, the Wars of the, the, the Wars of Succession. And oh my God, there's, there's just too, there's too much to talk about. And it, it's, I find it sometimes quite overwhelming to try and explain to someone why history is so great and why they shouldn't be worried about it or think that it's geeky. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's interesting that you brought up Game of Thrones because although it's not history, uh, in in many ways, considering what I have seen presented as historical fiction, naming no names to protect the guilty, in many ways, I think Game of Thrones is more evocative of a sense of the past than so many other things. And there's a phrase that I constantly repeat when people talk about, well, why did so-and-so do so-and-so? Or why would you ever do that? It's so immoral. And it, it, I always come back to what Cersei says. In the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. So that's why Margaret Beaufort does what she does. That's why Richard III does what he does. Oh, that's because a great one. Yeah. If you're close to the throne and you have any thought of vying for it, you best take it. Yeah. Because if you don't, Game over. It's, it's such a different world, isn't it? Such a different way of understanding how the crown works. Frankly, um, I'd be like, no thanks. I don't want anything to do with it. You know, because it's, it's life or death. Why bother? But people were so magnetised by the idea of power and control. It's, uh, what a different way of looking at it, but it's equally fascinating in, a, in just a dramatic sense anyway. Um, thank you so much. And I will leave links to your social media, to your Instagram in the description box, and I'll flash it up on the screen as well. Check it out. Everybody go follow, subscribe. It's brilliant. And as we know, there are images that are in the works that are being planned that are going to be super fun to see. So make sure that you are checking those out. Um, Torin, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to speak to you. And if there's anything else that you would like to tell people, please use the moment. Oh, well, uh, no, just I uh, hope you enjoy history by looking at the stuff that I put on Instagram. Thanks for having me, by the way. I'm, I'm no academic, but I do love a good chat about history. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Once again, I want to say a massive thank you to Torin for agreeing to sit down and talk to me about his Hunter of History Instagram page and, of course, history more generally. I really enjoyed myself. As I said a number of times, I will leave his Instagram links in my description box, so do check him out and make sure you follow so that you are up to date with all of his work. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up please also subscribe to the channel and maybe also check that you are still subscribed and that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. While you're there, checking, subscribing or resubscribing, why not also hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I'd also appreciate it if you share this video with your friends. But I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.